We're not trying to take away anything from anybody else. All we want is what everybody else has. If ever we needed in this country to adopt a new attitude to homosexuality, this is the time. We had no right to take what some may consider to be a moral wrong and make it a crime. We ought to recognize it for what it is. It's a, it's a mental illness. It's a psychiatric condition which ought to be treated by psychiatrists and social workers. The view we take here is that there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation. I understand in this very city, they have clubs where they wear girls' clothing and makeup and they carry on. Canada must be one. Canada must be progressive. And Canada must be a just society. Nineteen sixty nine. Some call it the year that changed everything. From Woodstock and a man on the moon to the Stonewall riots and the birth of the internet, 1969 was a tumultuous and transformative time. It was also the year Bill C-150 introduced sweeping changes to Canada's criminal code. One of its more contentious clauses dealt with reform to two provisions, buggery and gross indecency, leading to what is understood as the partial decriminalization of homosexuality. A story of criminality that dates back to Turtle Island and the arrival of the Europeans. There have always been First Nations people who have been two-spirited. Before, before white folks came to this continent, and since white folks have come to this continent, if we embrace this notion that we're queer, we're here, and that we've always been here, we've always been here regardless of our skin colors regardless of our religions, regardless of our communities or, or anything else. Traditionally, in indigenous communities, there were special roles and responsibilities for everyone. I think that uh, people, everyone that came into the world, into the community, was seen as having a particular gift and path in life and uh, a particular way of contributing to the community. There wasn't the um, sort of Western concept of uh, of binary uh, gender roles. So you could have uh, different gender roles in many Indigenous communities and also different uh, relationships in terms of sexual orientation, uh, same-sex relationships as well. So I think um, a lot of those ways of being were, were hugely disrupted by colonialism and Christianity and the more Western European and Christian views of uh, gender binaries and that are normative ideals that were imposed on the communities. So they wanted to discredit these people and to get the First Nations over to their side to understand that same-sex behavior was evil and therefore they shouldn't be listening to these evil people who are engaging in same-sex behavior and they should see the light and become Christians. And by the way, if they didn't, they could be reported to the police and they could be facing criminal charges. There was a lot of pressure, of course, placed on Indigenous communities to conform to the European Christian way of viewing the world. And that really had a, I think, a profound negative effect on Two-Spirit people in particular, uh, because it really uh, worked to erase the respect that existed for them and their roles and, and their space in the community, in their societies and ceremony and so on. But prior to the creation of this nation state, you know, no one was, no one is inherently criminal. It really blows my mind to think about how you can create an entire nation on top of a nation, on top of different communities, and then impose a whole series of laws that restrict the movement of almost every single person except for white, cisgendered, able-bodied males. And of course, once Canada took over its own criminal law in 1867, 
the torch of criminal persecution of the LGBT community was passed from England to Canada. And Canada uh, took up that torch of persecution and held it high uh, from 1867 through to 1969. The prohibition on gay sex had been around for a very long time. But two things changed in the 40s. Those two things were the defection of Igor Gazenko, which caused a social panic regarding the Soviet threat, and Professor Alfred Kinsey and his report on homosexual behavior. It used to be thought before Kinsey that same-sex behavior was extremely rare. It was extremely unusual, and it was the product of straight people who were oversexed or behaving badly. There was some thought that maybe there might be the odd, incurable homosexual who was dedicated to same-sex acts, but they were thought to be very rare. And of course, Kinsey came up with the famous figure of 10%. And that was about a thousand times more than people thought there were. People suddenly realized that they couldn't spot gay people anymore. And that ended up fusing with the Red Scare and became what Americans call the Lavender Scare, we call the LGBT Purge. The LGBT Purge was the systematic policy of identification and elimination of Canadian public servants and military personnel suspected or confirmed to be homosexual. It targeted both men and women and was implemented at the highest levels of government and was carried out with callous disregard for the dignity, privacy, and humanity of its targets for nearly four decades. By the time the 60s come along, the social mood starts to change rather dramatically. And we get our first LGBT rights organization in Vancouver in the early 60s, a group called the Association for Social Knowledge. And you may ask why such a ambiguous name. Well, of course, because the criminal law was very powerfully in effect at that time. If you had a meeting of people to talk about homosexuality, that would be a criminal conspiracy. And everyone at that meeting could be arrested. On n'avait aucun droit. Il n'y avait pas de communauté homosexuelle vraiment organisée. Il y avait quelques homosexuels qui pouvaient fréquenter des bars. Mais comme c'était interdit, on ne pouvait pas être au grand jour pour, sur la place publique pour faire des revendications et tout. Donc la communauté, euh, elle était quasi euh, inexistante. En tout cas, moi, personnellement, à cette époque-là, j'étais euh, autour de 20, 25 ans avant le bill omnibus. Et avant toutes ces années-là, je ne pouvais pas songer même à pouvoir à, à avoir une vie homosexuelle. Celle qui, celle qui le vivait ouvertement euh, ont souvent été euh, criminalisées, marginalisées euh, socialement. Et celles qui ont réussi à le faire sans ça, c'est parce qu'elles le dissimulaient. Donc, elles vivaient dans l'ombre complètement. Et ça, ça veut dire, par exemple, chez soi, euh, on n'a pas d'objet, on n'a pas de livre, euh, on ne fait jamais un geste qui pourrait être interprété ou donner lieu à des soupçons comme quoi on a une relation avec cette femme-là. Donc, ça veut dire vraiment s'auto-censurer constamment. Alors ça, c'est un prix psychologique énorme. This marginalization and criminalization affected far more than gay men and lesbian women, even though they weren't named at the time. There are most people who today might identify themselves as trans people. At that time, most of them didn't have words to identify themselves as trans people. And there were really no organized trans communities for them to engage in. And if they didn't have words to call themselves that, well, like, where would they go anyway? Even the cross-dressers, the people who at that time, they would have had the word transvestite to use for themselves would have mostly been hanging out in the gay world. Right? So uh, if someone who lived their, most of their lives as a heterosexual married man liked to wear women's clothing and wanted to go out somewhere, the most hospitable place to go would be a gay bar. today would call themselves uh, trans or non-binary or two-spirit would have thought of themselves as some kind of gay. 
So there is a reason to have those letters together because what the common cause is, is that we all share discrimination and stigma because the public does see it as all one and the same. And throughout uh, most of the 20th century, it was illegal, sinful, considered a mental illness to be homosexual, to be gender variant. Through much of that time, it was almost unknown or unheard of to be any kind of transgender. Nonetheless, people existed and people found each other, but they had to find each other in secret ways and secret places because there were no human rights protections. Social opprobrium was extremely high. Uh, they could not count on protection if they were attacked. They were often attacked by the police. Uh, so, yeah, times were very, very difficult. You know, churches weren't safe. You couldn't be openly gay in church. You could be fired from your job, and people routinely were. Uh, being hassled by the police, and in certain situations, like in Toronto, people were routinely uh, hassled by the police. Mais c'est très clair, et il y, y a des extraits de jugement a, qui le, le confirment que l'accusation de grossière indécence pouvait être portée euh, auprès de femmes. Et, euh, le plus souvent, c'était des accusations euh, qui ne tenaient pas la route, et les policiers le savaient. Donc, ce qu'on faisait, c'est que on, on, on les menaçait, on leur faisait peur. Parfois, on les emprisonnait pour une nuit. Euh, et là, on leur faisait subir les mêmes tests euh, qu'aux euh, prostituées ou travailleuses du sexe euh, à l'époque, c'est-à-dire un examen gynécologique assez brutal, on prenait leurs empreintes digitales. Donc, c'est quand même une certaine forme de criminalisation. So, our, our community did try to resist and fight back, but it, we were under siege um, all through the 40s, 50s and 60s. This climate of oppression and hostility was supported by sensationalist media. But there did exist early activist voices who sought to debunk public perception. For over a decade, beginning in the late 1940s, Jim Egan wrote countless letters of protest to mainstream newspapers, challenging the way homosexuals were portrayed. In 1963, McLean's magazine published the first positive mainstream report about homosexuals in a groundbreaking two-part series by journalist Sidney Katz. Jim Egan appeared in the article. He used a fake name in the story to avoid arrest. And then we get, of course, this magical moment in it with the Clippard case in 1967. A lower court ruling that would make every practicing homosexual in Canada liable to imprisonment for life was upheld today by the Supreme Court of Canada in a 3-2 decision. The majority ruling dismissed an appeal by Everett George Clippard, a 40-year-old mechanic sentenced to an indefinite period of preventative detention as a dangerous sexual offender. And the Supreme Court of Canada hands down this outrageous decision that says a gay man should be kept in prison for the rest of his life because he's an incurable homosexual. Now, at this point, the uh, young Turk, uh, Pierre Trudeau, was the new justice minister for Lester Pearson, and he came out with his famous statement. The view we take here is that uh, there's no place for the state in the bedrooms of the nation, and I think that, uh, you know, what's done in private between adults uh, doesn't concern the criminal code. And that little phrase caught on like wildfire. I, it's hard to overstate the importance of that idea. It made sense to people in Canada. Just as 10 years earlier, if you said to the average Canadian, well, homosexuals are a threat to national security, the average Canadian would have agreed with you immediately. Mais, ça, c'était une, une grande question qu'on s'est posée longtemps. Pourquoi Trudeau est arrivé avec ce projet-là? Parce que euh, quand il a commencé à parler de ça, les gens, lui, étaient célibataires, hein, et tout le monde disait qu'il qu était lui-même homosexuel. Donc, ça faisait vraiment un débat. He was young, he was sexy, he was a bachelor. You know, there were lots of whispers about his own sexuality. 
and it didn't hurt his popularity at all. It made him more interesting. Donc, je pense que ça a été vraiment ça l'élément déclencheur parce que Trudeau a été ministre de la Justice. Donc, c'est lui qui était responsable de ça, de savoir que quelqu'un était emprisonné pour cette raison-là. Donc, il a proposé le bill omnibus. John Turner was tasked with reforming the Canadian criminal law. This resulted in a 126-page, 120-clause amendment that Turner introduced in Canadian Parliament on December 19, 1968. Uh, and as far as I know, there was no discussion with, uh, with, with gay men or lesbians at the time at all. So uh, that meant that it was all being debated around people's lives, but not with the people who were most affected by it. Would you like to see some real changes in our attitudes as expressed in law toward homosexuals? Yes, I would. I don't think it should be ever put into the criminal code. I think it should be taken out. It should be done and in a medical way so that these people could be sent to centers if we feel as citizens who oppose the feeling of this illness and this homosexuality so they could be rehabilitated. If you were to look at the, uh, at the uh, debates in the House of Commons around all of this, I would say it's one of the great uh, kind of documents of homophobia. I mean, the things that people said that uh, MPs said were so full of ignorance. It was, it was, uh, it was absurd. It was ridiculous. Uh, the, uh, I think because it was part of an omnibus bill, uh, there were attempts to, to pull this one out along with abortion issues. Uh, the government refused to, and I, I'm sure that if it had been pulled out as a separate bill, it would have been defeated. Non, je pense que Trudeau était très habile justement pour la, la faire passer. Il était peut-être plus libéral que son bill ne, ne, ne l'était, c'est-à-dire que son attitude à lui, je, je l'ignore en fait, mais son attitude était peut-être plus ouverte, mais la façon de passer le bill, ça a été de, 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 de passer une loi qui couvrait plusieurs euh, sujets, la loterie, l'avortement, euh, donc en, en le faisant passer comme un tout, euh, c'était difficile de voter contre si on est en faveur de d'autres aspects. D'ailleurs, dans l'opposition, on demandait que le bill soit scindé, notamment les créditistes qui étaient représentés au Parlement fédéral à l'époque avaient demandé que ce soit, représenté, que ce soit scindé euh, pour euh, voter certaines choses en faveur de certaines parties et contre d'autres. Donc, c'était assez habile de, pour Trudeau de, de, de le présenter comme ça sous forme de loi omnibus. This was not passed easily. Uh, even if it was pretty negative from our set, if you look at it really historically, it wasn't that great a thing. Uh, and it was in that context of pathology that, uh, that, it, was, uh, that it was accepted. Be better that they be, they're sick, but you know, they shouldn't have the, the, the law sicked on them. To, to move things from a certain kind of political threat to an individual pathology threat and we can think, okay, so we have decriminalization, a limited form in the late 60s, but we continue to pathologize homosexuality as a disease of the brain until the 80s. To be pathologized is to be thought of as defective in your makeup in some way. Something internal in you is broken. And so there's often a little more sympathy. It's not the prettiest sympathy. It's not particularly complimentary. But there's a different moral tone to it. Uh, instead of treating it as a crime and driving it underground, we ought to recognize it for what it is. It's a, it's a mental illness. It's a psychiatric condition. So people like Tommy Douglas, who you might have expected would be positive, simply had probably never met any gay man, every gay person. So uh, as far as he was concerned, uh, you know, it was pretty distant and uh, kind of icky. And, you know, it didn't, it seemed peripheral to the bigger kind of uh, progressive issues, political issues, I think. If uh, Tommy Douglas had had a, uh, you know, a lesbian daughter, then that might have made a difference. Bill C-150 received royal assent on June 27, 1969. The offenses of buggery and gross indecency were still in force. However, the new act introduced exemptions for married couples and any two consenting adults above the age of 21, regardless of gender or sexual orientation, provided the acts took place in private. <laughs> 
Our reaction for many people is ambivalence because I think uh, when you look at what it really did, which was simply create an exemption for a limited aspect of sexuality in private, uh, while it kept on on the books all the uh, all the codes, all the uh, lines which said gross indecency and buggery and so forth. Uh, stayed in place in public situations. So it really didn't change very much. It basically exempted an area where there were not arrests anyway. Alors, le, le, la décriminalisation partielle de 1969, à mon avis, était à la fois un tournant majeur parce que ça a ouvert un espace de tolérance envers l'homosexualité en disant que l'homosexualité ou les, les, les actes homosexuels n'étaient pas intrinsèquement criminels. Cela dit, ce n'est pas le progrès euh, qu'on pense parfois que c'était. Euh, ce n'est pas de dire, euh, voilà, c'est beau l'homosexualité. Ce <rire> n'est vraiment pas une approbation de l'homosexualité. Euh, c'est plutôt de, 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 de renvoyer ça euh, à d'autres instances sociales. Le fait que les LGBT gens ne sont plus automatiquement peur de aller en jail simplement parce qu'ils aiment quelqu'un d'autre de la même genre gender. Um, meant that when people didn't have to be afraid of being branded a criminal, it gave a lot more freedom for people to be out and to have conversations with their family, their friends, their co-workers, etc. So it was an absolutely crucial moment. Did it solve everything? No, it didn't. And any time there's a movement by government, for instance, to make a major change, then there are going to be years of work afterwards to clean it up to make sure that other laws are changed, to bring it into to agreement with the decision. Um, there is a whole cultural piece that has to happen. There were various different laws that were introduced from 1867 to 1969. Every single one of those laws made things worse for the LGBT community. 1969 was the first time, the first time, that Parliament passed a law that made things better for the LGBT community. Changing the law in 1969 to legalize homosexuality, of course, was a huge breakthrough. It opens up the door for rulings on specific issues about, well, what does it mean that this is now legal? What can you and can't you do? What can you and can't you say? And it makes it more possible for organizing to start. After 1969, we get the first LGBT rights organization, the University of Toronto Homophile Association. And there have been hundreds of them since that time. My late friend George Hislop said people need to realize that those organizations would have been impossible before 1969. That opened the door to community-based organizations. That first meeting was in October of 1969. So that, that was inspirational to me. And uh, I wanted to get involved in that. I knew we, I needed to be involved in something that was making a change. You know, this was a time of great uh, change in the world, especially in North America. And uh, there was the civil rights movement with African Americans in the U.S. Uh, there was women's liberation. Uh, and so the sense that people can, uh, you know, change the world, that we need to make change, uh, uh, that was a model, I think, that uh, people began to think could apply to us as, as, as queer people. In the 1970s in Canada was a time when feminism was on the rise, uh, gay organizing was on the rise, and people were starting to think about the word liberation was in the, in the air a lot. You know, the, there was gay liberation, there was women's liberation, there was um, a, opposition to the Vietnam War, which also had the word liberation in it. And so people were starting to get excited, young people were starting to get excited in particular, and there were protests everywhere. The, uh, the We Demand um, <clears throat> demonstration, which is the first public national demonstration, it was in Ottawa in um, in August of, uh, of 71. Canadian homosexuals are having their careers ruined, being kicked out of their churches, having their children taken away from them, and being assaulted in the streets of our own city. What have we done to deserve this? Love, that's all we have done. All we want to do is love persons of the same sex and live our lives we decide for ourselves. We're fed up with the lack of basic respect to all human beings. The We Demand Manifesto 
was a very important one because it said, okay, so we, we have these limited uh, uh, changes in the criminal code, but they don't really affect people uh, in where they really live. It was uh, an attempt to write a, a summary about the demonstration in Gorilla, which was uh, a local countercultural newspaper. It had been pretty positive about gay issues, but it was edited. It didn't, it didn't cover what, what people wanted to cover. So the thought was, okay, then we need to write, we need to create our own newspaper, and that's where the body politic was born. The first really public newspaper, uh, queer newspaper in Canada, uh, and the things we wrote about were important. And we did a number of things. We recorded uh, all this, all the incidents of discrimination, which had never been recorded before. We created a nonprofit organization, Pink Triangle Press, to, uh, to kind of keep it going. We also uh, were a collective. We were not a business. We were not owned by anybody. Um, and so that meant that no one could just destroy it. So groups on the ground, organizing on their own with a lot of knowledge around what their communities need are consistently the groups that push forth the most change. They're the ones who lobby governments. They're the ones who create a sense of connection and community. They're ones that um, connect people to a sense of purpose and have a unique experience, a unique knowledge of what is really affecting people. Uh, la mouvance lesbienne uh, commence à s'organiser, mais les premiers groupes dans les années 70, c'est assez instable. Babyface, c'est une lesbienne uh, butch qui va initier ça, qui va convaincre le crime organisé finalement de dire <laughs> il, y a, il y a un public uh, et je veux uh, qui va se voir confier la gérance de certains bars pour lesbiennes. Au début, ça fonctionnera pas, mais éventuellement, ça va fonctionner. Pour les femmes, le principal problème, c'était en fait d'avoir des espaces, parce qu'il y en avait très peu. Donc, ce sont des espaces à la fois de, de sociabilité, mais des espaces aussi très politiques, très politisés, euh, où il y a beaucoup de discussions, beaucoup de tensions, d'ailleurs, politiques, autour des tendances euh, politiques qui peuvent surgir à ce moment-là. And tensions did mount. On October 22, 1977, police armed with machine guns raided two bars in Montreal, trucks, and Le Mystique. 146 men were arrested under vague body house and gross indecency laws. Comme les majorités des bars étaient pour hommes, les descentes avaient lieu dans les bars pour hommes, mais il y a aussi eu des descentes dans les bars pour femmes, y compris chez Babyface. La conquête d'espace public et de la possibilité. De, de se rencontrer, d'exprimer de, euh, qui on est de, de, dans des espaces publics. Alors, il va y avoir beaucoup, beaucoup de tensions euh, parce que la répression policière, elle, se maintient en évoquant le, le public. The day following the raids, 3,000 people filled the streets of Montreal in protest. Two months later, Quebec includes sexual orientation in its human rights code, the first such protection for lesbians and gays anywhere in the world. The law makes it illegal to discriminate against gays in housing, public accommodation, and employment. The celebration was short-lived. Fifteen days later in Toronto, another raid, this one on the office of the body politic. And when they showed up at the door, which was on a Friday night around 6 o'clock, they said they were going to take this place apart. They took away boxes and boxes of material. Uh, they, they looked for a, a, a a piece of the criminal code that was very odd, I don't think it had ever been used before, was uh, using the mails to distribute immoral, indecent, and scurrilous literature, uh, because we mailed it. It was a subscription-based thing. They took away our subscription list, so of course that terrified people. And so, um, you know, we had to fight back around that one, but we did continue publishing. And in fact, we became a bit of a cause. You know, it became around uh, around censorship uh, and around uh, the police. That became a real issue for us because we were a cause. That isn't what we set out to be, but that's what we became. In 1981, um, there were a number of bathhouses in Toronto. And the bathhouses were an important institution in our city. And it's not about whether you're pro-sex or anti-sex, pro-bathhouses or anti-bathhouses, in my opinion. That's totally irrelevant. They're an institution, they're an important institution, and the people who want to choose to go should be able to go. And they're a safe place, the least dangerous place for gay men mostly, but there were lesbian best, 
mostly gay men to go and to, to meet people, to socialize, to make friends, and to have sex in a safe way. But in 81, the police raided a number of baths and, and, and uh, arrested hundreds of men, and they tore the places apart, terrorized the people in those institutions, in the baths. And in one of the baths, the Richmond Street, they lined people up in the shower area, and one of the police officers said, I wish those showers were hooked up to gas instead of water. The raids were estimated to cost the taxpayers of Toronto a quarter of a million dollars, and police with crowbars and sledgehammers are alleged to have caused over $35,000 damage. In the bath raids in 1981, I was held by two police officers and beaten by a third. So this is an overreach of surveillance and of police, uh, police efforts that, uh, that people didn't think would happen, so they, it, it made them feel much more vulnerable that uh, these safe spaces, we thought they were safe community spaces, they were commercial, but they were safe community spaces, could be so uh, 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 interfered with, and uh, that, that I think was what made people think, no, no, we, this, this can't happen, we need to protest this. Gay right now! Gay right now! Gay right now! There are all kinds of people who had never protested before, but because they arrested so many people, almost everybody knew somebody who'd been arrested, and people were really pissed off, really, really angry, and came out in hundreds and thousands, and straight people came out, and the, it was the first time that people were really protesting in these kinds of numbers. No longer will we stand idly by while the politicians ignore us, the police abuse us, and the right wing lie about us. Three thousand people marched in protest in downtown Toronto the night following the raids. In all, four gay bathhouses were raided, and nearly 300 men were arrested. It was the largest mass arrest in Canada under Prime Minister Trudeau since the October crisis. I think that was always a kind of a, a thing that kept us going, is that we were resisting these attempts to, uh, to, to squash us, to flatten us, to silence us, and we weren't going to have that happen. The movement was growing, lots of organizations being formed, and more and more activists speaking out and stuff. And then our people started to die. so awful at first we couldn't find a funeral home to take the bodies and you know there was no support systems and we had to build our own support and in particular you know lesbians sacrificed their own health needs and took a back step in order to be able to care for the gay men who were dying and uh, so it it shifted us I think from activism to care and a lot of the energy went into supporting HIV AIDS organizations, justifiably so, to raising funds because, you know, the government didn't step in. So there was some pressures to say, we're going to close the bathhouses, we're going to stop having, stop having sex. You know, there was that kind of panic thing happening in New York because it was so overwhelming. We had the chance to say, no, just a minute now, we don't want to do that. And so the body politic again was kind of important in terms of saying, making the case against panic. It was one of our cover draws on it, the case against panic. Let's make sure that we fought hard for our right for sexuality and we're not gonna give it up now. So, you know, it was, it, was, it was a terrible time, but it was also a fabulous time in terms of seeing how people came together and supported each other. And the bars did, you know, innumerable uh, fundraisers to help uh, the organization. And it, I think it set up a kind of a tradition of sex positivity and the safer sex information that we distributed. The 80s were also a time of increased visibility and organizing for some communities. So the talk shows got big in the 80s and they were mostly sensationalist. They were mostly freak shows, not just about trans people, about everybody. That's basically what the talk shows were about, but they had a big audience. 
and uh, they got started to get interested in trans people. And so a wider range of people became aware that something could be done for them. So even if the talk shows were presented in an exploitative way, in a sensationalist way, as a freak show, it still served an important purpose for those people at home going, oh my God, look at that guy. He looks great, you know? He's got a life and he looks good. And I could do that. And I think by the late 80s, early 90s, you started to see uh, human rights uh, enforcement uh, starting to get some traction in tribunals and courts in Canada. So uh, I also think it was around this time that um, that uh, uh, more two-spirit people started to get organized. And I think it was around 1990 in Manitoba that a group of two-spirit people uh, first started using the term two-spirit itself. And I think since that time, uh, we've seen a lot more organization of two-spirit and trans people and uh, a lot more advocacy and a lot more visibility. And what changed in the mid-90s for trans people was the internet. Trans people, by current estimates, which I think are pretty good estimates, are maybe half, maybe 1% of the population. So how do you organize? How do you develop a movement when there's so few of you and you can't find each other? But one of the things that the internet has done, not just for trans people, but for a lot of people, it has allowed people who are geographically dispersed to create online communities, to find each other, to communicate with each other, and to develop relationships, even though they don't live in the same place. And so trans organizing really took off in the 90s. Organizing that recalls the Kinsey Report from the late 1940s and challenges public opinion. The realization that there are a lot more trans people than once imagined. Organizing for other communities has been a harder struggle. For the intersex community, um, things actually got worse after 1969 because um, issues around control of infants and children identified as intersex has to do with actually preventing their autonomous decision making later. So the idea is that um, medicine had all of these tools, um, chemical and surgical, to intervene into the bodies of these children. And the idea was to produce at least socially appearing heterosexuals later. So the idea was to just eliminate the possibility of queerness, which was the threat posed by these unusual bodies or bodies perceived as unusual. And so by the end of the 90s, we actually had a new criminal law that specifically allows for the intervention onto these bodies in order to shoehorn them, which is what Anne Fausto Sterling said, into an either male or female designation that could then be apprehended, regardless of a criminal code around sexuality, as socially deviant or socially appropriate. In Canada, doctors are allowed to perform surgeries on intersex children, intersex babies. They're covered. It's, a, it's excluded from the criminal code. Like, so intersex genital mutilation, mutilation is legal in this country. Um, which is appalling, absolutely appalling. So we're pushing to have that changed. We're pushing to have the criminal code changed to make it illegal for surgeons and doctors to interfere with children, babies, infants, um, until they decide what they want to do themselves. Why, 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 why change, you know? What's, what's wrong with, with being an intersex person? Why do we all have to fit into this nice, neat little box? And if you fall out of this box, then you can't be, you know, male or female anymore. You've got to be something else. And then we have to solve you, right? And I'm very concerned with that need to solve other people and create problems out of them. I think, could David Bowie exist now? <laughs> that man looked fine in a dress. <laughs> and he is, you know, 
also the thin white duke who could rock a suit. Like, I mean, that man had a very rich gender presentation. Why can't we all have that very rich gender presentation? What all of us have in common is that we suffer from some level of stigma and discrimination for not doing gender the way we're supposed to. And the people who suffer the most are the people who are the most obviously not doing gender the way they're supposed to. So if we look at just the first two letters, the lesbian and gay community, who is it who gets beat up? Who is it who, get, who loses their jobs and who gets the most severe discrimination? It's the most masculine women and the most feminine of men. What it means is that we're not actually deconstructing what otherness is, right? So I'll accept you as long as you conform to my sense of myself. And if you're a little bit different this way or a little bit that different that way, so it's not a full embrace of diversity or intersectionality, right? It's really uh, an, an embrace of likeness. I was really lucky to get to watch Kimberly Crenshaw, who really coined the term intersectionality, talk a lot about it. And I think a lot of people often distill it to ideas of uh, identity, but she really specifically explains it as it's not just being about identity, but the ways in which our identities are made vulnerable as a product of experiences of oppression. I often talk about this idea of reframing the golden rule. And so, you know, the golden rule tells people that we should treat people the way that we want to be treated. But the challenge with that is that it assumes that we're the standard for other people's experience. And I often invite people to treat others the way that they want to be treated, which means we have to ask. And so this works on both an individual level when I'm talking with people about how you just, you know, make sure you ask people's pronouns, make sure you ask people how to pronounce their names, things like that that are small and simple and can be changed very quickly, but also in a larger context when we're thinking institutionally, instead of determining that you know what a population needs, it's important to get a very direct conversation, a direct line to that population and allow them to be very clear about creating what safety looks like, what access looks like. Other people in these discussions, here, there, and everywhere, will say, well, don't you want a third sex designation for intersex on all of your documents? And I'm like, oh, hell no. So there are people who get very excited about the idea that intersex is somehow going to liberate everybody else. We're gonna lead the gender party, that if intersex could be recognized as such, then all the other third kinds of categories could also be recognized as such. For me, that's a non sequitur. You don't need to recognize intersex as a third anything in order for trans people's rights to be respected and upheld and set into law. These things are independent of each other, but forcing gender designations and sex designations onto the documents of infants and children apprehended as intersex is actually very dangerous. Introducing unnecessary threats to the lives of intersex and queer youth further compounds an already alarming situation in Canada. We know that in the city of Toronto, for example, and in other jurisdictions across the country, 23% of the youth homeless population identifies as LGBT. So, and that's an under, that's understated because we didn't capture the kids who were precariously housed or the ones who were couch surfing. So we know the number to be higher, but that is a number that the city works from and it's a, a number that we work from as well. So that's a huge problem with young kids being kicked out of their homes because of, of who they are. It can be very, very difficult to do it, to be the person to be open about the fact that you're, you're gender variant if the consequences are significant. And you never know. Everyone in that whole LGBTQ spectrum knows stories about terrible things that have happened to people who were out or who have happened to people who were perceived to be gay, lesbian, bi, trans, queer, two-spirit. You don't have to be to get discriminated against. People have to just think you are. These contemporary external forces of oppression are reminiscent of the Bill C-150 era, 
Queer and trans youth continue to live in a society that's not built for them to exist free of discrimination and violence. Present day struggles for social equality stem from legal wins that occurred in the 2000s. When we were arrived at the end of 2000, I saw the juridical equality coming. I thought, well, we're going to have the juridical equality soon, the marriage and everything. We have to work for the social equality to be recognized in the society. Donc, pour faire ça, il faut faire de l'éducation, de la sensibilisation, de l'information. Donc, j'ai créé la Fondation Émergence. Et la Fondation Émergence, sa mission, c'est de faire de l'éducation, de la sensibilisation. À partir de la Fondation Émergence, j'ai créé un programme de sensibilisation, la Journée de lutte à l'homophobie, qui est devenue une journée internationale, qui s'est célébrée à plusieurs, à plusieurs endroits. Et après ça, j'avais créé... Là, je me voyais vieillir. <rire> fait, je pense un peu à moi. J'ai créé le programme qui s'appelle Pour que vieillir soit gay. C'est un programme qui a une dizaine d'années qui roule, roule encore. C'est un programme qui de sensibilisation dans le milieu des aînés. You know, I'm, I'm sitting just a few feet from where the first legal same-sex weddings in the world happened. Metropolitan Community Church of Toronto. When I did the first equal you know, marriages between two men and two women. I had to wear a bulletproof vest because of the death threats. I had 12 bodyguards protecting me. I was assaulted that morning in church, you know. I, I half-jokingly say that the 12 bodyguards were 11 of the toughest-looking lesbians you've ever seen in your life and one gay man coordinating it all. And there were a thousand people came and uh, they all had to be searched to get in, the, in the, the building. There were 80 media outlets from around the world. The night before, I called my parents at home and said, I love you. You know, if anything happens, please know that I love you. And uh, so it was a terrifying day. It was an exciting day. Um, there were protesters outside. And, you know, we married the first lesbian and gay couples anywhere in the history of the world, right here in this church in Toronto, January the 14th, 2001. Making faith-based spaces and practices increasingly queer positive is a movement that extends beyond the achievement of marriage equality. So the interesting thing is people tell me you can't be gay and be Muslim um, from all directions. Well, the reality is, if we're, even if we're 2% of the population, we're 30 million people. We're the population of Canada as, as queer Muslims, right? Whenever the religious right are able to frame the argument of God versus gays, we lose. I'm going to be Christian and give up being gay, or I'm going to be gay and give up being Christian, right? And they realize that spirituality and sexuality can come together. I believe that uh, my spirituality is something that's innate to me. Um, and uh, I also believe my sexual orientation is something that's innate to me. So my struggle is, is blending, merging, and reconciling my elements. So the Unity Mosque is, uh, is our attempt to deconstruct religious space, uh, to embrace the fullness of the spirituality of every created being, um, who is already embraced by God, but to have that embrace manifest in social space. We're now in our 10th year in Toronto, and um, there's people out there who've heard of our space, and they want to call it the gay mosque. But the reality is that about 50% of my community, of my congregation, is not queer identified. And I think that's what makes this space actually a little bit more dangerous to the dominant, to, to, to the dominant community, because it says that not everybody's fitting into these dominant uh, community spaces, regardless of what their sexual orientation or their gender identity may be. And then maybe that's a gift that queer folks can give to the larger world, is, is how we deconstruct space to make them more inclusive. Um, not just for ourselves, but for, uh, for other people as well. The work of creating spaces where queer and trans people can live and love freely has the power to transform the world into a freer, safer place for everybody. So the voices that always get captured are the dominant voices, are the most visible voices, right? So when we're archiving our stories, um, the queer struggle has never been a white struggle or a white-only struggle. We forget that at Stonewall, it was trans women of color. It was black and Latina trans women who picked up their heels and smacked the first white cop in the head, right? They're written out of the narrative.
So no, all of a sudden, Stonewall becomes about white gay men. We often see a retelling of history where conspicuously so many people are not included. And I think this is true in so many different capacities. I think it's true in a lot of history. So one of the activities I do with my students is um, we write down all the people that we learned about in history when we were in high school um, that were not white men. And the list is so short. You know, we don't learn about LGBT people. We don't even learn about women. We don't learn about even indigenous people. You know, we there's a lot of history that gets really conspicuously erased in order to create a very specific narrative. And so if we're not recognized as being queer enough or as being Canadian enough or whatever enough, then our stories are not going to be told. And so it doesn't mean that there were no queer people of color in the 40s or in the 50s or in the 60s or in the 70s, that there weren't uh, racialized people in uh, uh, whose lives were ruined by the bathhouse raids uh, or, or anything else for that matter, but their stories are just not being told. Comme l'histoire n'est pas très valorisée dans notre société, on ne sent pas toujours cet intérêt, que ce soit chez les jeunes gays ou chez les jeunes lesbiennes, parce que maintenant, on vit dans une société où c'est beaucoup l'individualisme, la performance du ici, maintenant, le reste s'est dépassé. Et nous voulons un endroit où les jeunes gens peuvent voir que nous avons une histoire qui est à la fois proud et sad, et nous voulons tout cela être visible aux gens quand ils grandissent. One of the archives and special collections of the University of Victoria is the Transgender Archives. It is the largest collection anywhere in the world of original historical documents and materials uh, recording transgender activism and transgender research. The materials come from uh, 23 different countries in 15 languages from every continent except Antarctica. So it's a very extensive collection. This is the stuff that historians use to write history. And trans history so far is largely unwritten. It's important for younger queers coming up uh, through the ranks. Whether they want to embrace it or not, they should know about it. They should realize that it hasn't been an easy ride. It hasn't been an easy journey. Um, and certainly for other folks globally, uh, they would love to be decriminalized. You know, there's 69 countries where we're still criminal. Uh, 36, I believe, of the Commonwealth countries are still, we're still criminals. Uh, there are atrocities going on towards our people all over the world, and I think Canada sh should swing the doors wide open for those refugees to come here, because after all, we carried on like that ourselves for a very long time, and we can't make it up to all of the people who went to their graves without justice, but what we can do is offer a little justice to people who are facing the same kinds of persecution in other countries around the world. That would go some distance to making up for our errors of the past. Well, I think a first step is, is educating oneself. So, um, I think it's really important for non-Indigenous people in this country to learn something about uh, the history of Indigenous people, the true history, uh, what the actual effects of colonization were, and what they continue to be today, because it's an ongoing thing. It, uh, it hasn't stopped the negative impacts of colonization. It persists today. And for people to understand that. Politically, we've seen a global really rise in a very populist sentiment. This idea and a very xenophobic approach to governance where people are really um, looking at other people as the other. And so because of this, I think it becomes incredibly urgent for people to really speak up very vocally and to also think about what their relationship with, you know, political spaces looks like. We would like to think of Canada as, uh, as the warm fuzzy, you know, and we often define ourselves in the negative. We're not America. We're not like that. And yet I think current affairs and current politics and the rise of the uh, outspoken and ignorant right, how both south of the border is also being reflected here, north of the border. Um, and we tend to obfuscate 
um, a lot of these issues around intersectionality. So I think for many indigenous LGBTQ people, um, they may find the need to leave their home communities because of uh, discrimination, violence, threats of violence, and often end up trying to uh, find acceptance by going to perhaps larger urban centers. But then when they arrive in larger urban centers, uh, they may face other forms of discrimination, even perhaps from uh, mainstream LGBTQI organizations that don't have services that are specific uh, to the needs of Indigenous peoples. And, you know, I come with certain economic and social privileges. I speak English as my first language. I'm a lawyer. And so I move in certain circles. But I, I often wonder what, for example, my clients who uh, don't share the same socioeconomic um, privileges, who may not necessarily speak English as a first language or who may speak it with a, a stronger accent of some sort um, as to how it plays out in terms of their under, uh, of how they are perceived and how uh, they move through the world. And so I suspect that a lot of people actually have to remain closeted in different places, in different spaces, even within a city like Toronto. Um, I think there's a lot of, uh, some people want to remain invisible because of their, uh, they're afraid, they're afraid to come out. There's still shame associated with um, being queer and your queerness. And, and I think that that's a, that's a societal piece that can only be changed through education. It can only be changed through changing the hearts and minds of people. So we're no longer invisible. Oui, malheureusement, les lesbiennes ont toujours eu euh, ce qu'on pourrait appeler un déficit de visibilité sociale, et leur histoire a toujours été plus euh, effacée, moins connue euh, que celle des hommes gays. It really is only because people keep urgently pushing and fighting back that they fight against that erasure. I mean, it's only now that we're starting to hear through um, uh, around the history of um, Alan Turing, for example, and some other people who have contributed tremendously through, uh, through history. But we never hear these stories. We don't hear them through um, through our education. We don't hear them through our history lessons. Or if we do, we don't, they're not identified as being members of our community. Uh, it's really important for us to see those role models through history so we can recognize the contributions that we've made to society. What I will find in the archive is a history of practices, but I will not find the voices of intersexualized people there. And I will not find understandings of identification or feeling. It will be an affectless set of documents that will describe procedures. And my only interest in going there is to reveal the practice that we all know is still going on. So testimony continues to be the most powerful way of, of finding each other. At the same time, I'm very apprehensive about testimony because living in the moment of testimony means perpetually returning to the wound. Continuing the conversations, continuing to archive our stories and to tell our stories, I think becomes very, uh, very important uh, in documenting. And, and so even uh, a project such as this becomes extremely important because it's not only just about, uh, for me, um, documenting the past, but actually uh, building an archive towards the future. But even a project such as this film is as contentious as the proposed reform was itself over 50 years ago. But this time, the loudest critical voices come from within Canadian queer communities who have mobilized calling themselves Anti-69. We're not looking just at the external world that's uh, fighting us. We're looking at uh, differences with amongst ourselves. And maybe that seems uh, kind of scary. But I think ultimately it will be good because we have to work this through, uh, and uh, because our community has changed a lot. I mean, this is this is a, this is a very rainbow community in all kinds of ways, and uh, none of those changes will come about without some hardship and some tension and some challenges. I don't think any of us is naive enough to think that um, decriminalization solved our problems. I think we need to start from there. I think it's really important to hear uh, the anti-69 
perspective. You know, I, I think that it's part of the narrative. Justement, en faisant de telles célébrations euh, qu'on rentre dans ce discours euh, qui occulte les luttes des personnes LGBT et qui euh, verse dans un discours homonationaliste. Euh, et je pense que dans ce sens-là, euh, on peut s'opposer aux célébrations. Euh, C'est-à-dire qu'il y a un discours qui, et on le voit au Québec, on le voit au fédéral, comme quoi c'est l'État finalement qui nous a donné des droits. Euh, et, euh, et souvent, on va, va revoir, euh, bon, euh, telle loi, telle loi, le, 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 le bill omnibus, et puis ensuite une autre législation, et puis la reconnaissance du mariage, et puis au Québec, on ajoutera au passage la reconnaissance d'une union civile, et on a l'impression qu'on a une réécriture de l'histoire où c'est l'État qui nous a octroyé des, des droits, alors que dans les faits, ce sont toujours les, les communautés LGBT qui se sont battues pour, pour les droits. But I do think that this is part of why it is so important for us to be telling our own histories and to ensure that this narrative doesn't get wrapped up in a narrative about Canada that's just used to applaud for, civil, for, for it being a bastion of human rights, that it's important for us to have other accounts and other narratives that complicate this idea of this just being progress or just a win, but rather that it is something um, that wasn't complete and continues to not offer a complete kind of protection to LGBT people. You know, Black Lives Matter uh, in its, uh, in its uh, stopping of the, of the Pride March um, a couple of years ago was a, was a seismic moment. I believe it was an important mo moment that it made people who are white recognize their privilege and recognize that there are changes that need to be made. Many of the most marginalized queer and trans people, black and indigenous people, people of color, poor people, refugees, sex workers and disabled people, amongst others, continue to mobilize powerfully, not only in response to present and ongoing experiences of violence and discrimination by police and by other state policies and practices, but also in response to invisibility and neglect within largely white LGBTQ institutions. I think a lot of activist movements can sometimes function in ways where we will determine that we're going to allow, we're going to fight for the rights for some people and then come back and get everyone else's later. And I, off, and I don't think that works. There's still a notion as to what queer people and what queer families look like. And so there's also a racial component to all of this, right? Um, and the whole issue around intersectionality as to, you know, uh, are you queer enough? Are you Canadian enough? Are you gay enough? Are you brown enough? Uh, that all sort of plays into um, how uh, homosexuality is constructed and how decriminalization or equality uh, manifests and how uh, people can access that in our society. Notions of access relate directly not only to the shortcomings of the 1969 reform, but its legacy, both good and bad. That's one of the reasons why 1969 didn't solve all of our problems because the police still viewed us as criminal classes long after 1969. The police did not support the reforms in 1969. I can assure you, neither did the Catholic Church, but they never, they opposed everything that we did, you know? If we had claimed the right to oxygen, they would have opposed that as well. I think John Turner and Pierre Trudeau pushed the envelope as much as they possibly could. And if you look at other countries, you know, people carp about the restrictions, oh, 021 and only two people. Well, those same restrictions also appear in the UK law reforms. They appear in the German law reforms. That was the standard that other, if you were a great democracy that was reforming your anti-gay law in that era, what Canada did was completely consistent with what other democratic societies were doing. Would it have been better if we repealed it altogether? Yes, I agree with that, but that wasn't gonna happen. Would people prefer that we were like the United States? 
they didn't get struck down. In fact, the same-sex marriage decision from the Ontario Court of Appeal came out only a few weeks before the United States Supreme Court said in Lawrence in Texas that it was unconstitutional to have an anti-sodomy law. That's what we would have been faced with if 1969 hadn't happened. You cannot imagine the amount of misery that those anti-sodomy laws caused in the United States and the amount of blood and treasure and time that was poured into the fight against those anti-sodomy laws by activists in our community. We didn't have to worry about that in Canada. Now, there were challenges to the restrictions after the charter came into effect, but the reality is that we were liberated. The adults in our community were liberated, were given the freedom to live their lives as they wanted to, their sex lives as they wanted to, but they were also freed to agitate for improvements in their lives. It's no accident that the first demonstration took place on Parliament Hill in favor of LGBT rights, the L We Demand demonstration took place a couple of years after 1969, not a couple of years before 1969. And activism within Queer Canada remains of central importance in the journey to full equality. But I think the, the, po the folks who um, outside of the community who feel that would go, oh my goodness, you know, we gave you marriage, now what do you want, you know? We have it all, we have marriage. Well, and marriage is not the panacea for uh, what ails us, you know? It hasn't been um, the cure for oppression or discrimination or violence. We still have very high rates of violence against uh, our community. We have um, hate crimes against our community, of which they're the most violent of any hate crimes. Uh, I think discrimination absolutely is like a really present experience and marginalization is a present experience for LGBT people. Folks ex still experience discrimination at their jobs. I know so many trans women of color who really struggle to even just get hired. Places that when you walk in, say that they're hiring and then, you know, as soon as they see you, they've decided that they're not anymore. We have a lot of issues that still need to be addressed. We have high rates of suicides in our community. We have, um, uh, issues of isolation, depression, suicide, anxiety, mental health issues in our seniors population. Um, so it, it definitely is not in the past. So it's not enough for us to, when we talk about, you know, access within queer community, to just talk about, you know, gay folks or lesbians or cisgender people. It's really important for us to understand that, you know, for folks of color who are queer, for folks who are black and disabled and trans, that their experiences are particularly vulnerable in institutions because of the ways in which their identities um, exist in relationship to the systems that we are all working within. This anniversary presents a moment of reflection, not just on the past 50 years, but on the dreams for the next 50. I hope that schools will be having open dialogues with students about LGBT um, folks, about um, folks from different cultures and backgrounds and religions, and that is a normative part of curriculums. Um, that from very, very small, that children's books can exist uh, that have conversations about the people who are in our communities and really demonstrate how to treat people with respect. Because, again, when you don't teach people that people exist, they don't know how to treat them when they find them for the first time. The next 50 years, my vision is that we have to arrive to be individuals who will not have an etiquette of homosexual or lesbian or whatever, that we are people. And that we are gay, 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 qu'on soit hétéro, qu'on soit transgenre, n'importe quoi, peu importe, qu'on ait une, notre propre identité et que la société ne questionne pas notre identité. By then, I think we will have abandoned the idea that gender is binary. I think we will have abandoned the idea that trying to divide up the way we organize society on the basis of gender is 
that we will have abandoned that idea, that we will have moved away from gender as an organizing principle. I want to see a much more diverse community uh, that actually understands people different from themselves and that uh, mm -hmm. the sense of white supremacy and white uh, privilege doesn't uh, kind of overwhelm the world as it does now. That right to have an ordinary, quiet life, you know, um, which I think in many ways is what the entire queer community, whatever it is, is hoping for, to just be able to live. Right? We just want to have our lives and not be an affaire d'état. So, yeah. Not to be a, a subject for regulation. So, that's where I'd like to get in the future. I hope that we will achieve true substantive equality for all Canadians. And uh, in light of my, you know, recent work, I, I really hope that we achieve true substantive equality for all Indigenous women, girls, and two SLGBTQIA people. There's, you know, there definitely is a, um, a movement to effect positive change for people, not only here in Canada, but around the world. You know, there's a movement to make the folks who are coming after us not have to feel and experience the same type of hardships that we have had to endure. Uh, and it's, there's a, um, a sense of, we want to change the world, but we want to make the world a better place. I'm really proud, you know, that, that, uh, that Canada um, would have a leader who would say that the state has no business in the bedrooms of a nation. That the Governor General uh, uh, would give, you know, the Order of Canada to a gay activist. You know, I'm proud of, of our courts. When the politicians wouldn't act, we went to the courts and they helped tremendously. I'm proud of, you know, so many LGBT lawyers and their brilliance, and they did all of it pro bono over and over and over again to fight all those court cases. You know, uh, and I'm proud of, of young activists all over the world. And I'm, you know, proud that I lived long enough to see that we could have a 50th anniversary of decriminalization. That when so many countries of the world aren't there yet, we're celebrating 50 years and looking at all of the things we've accomplished in those 50 years. And I'm proud that we have that ability to celebrate what's been accomplished and to know we have a lot more work to do. And both are true. <laughs>